Me and my family grew up in, in the US. I was around five. I started to do these clay sculptures with my hands that were based on my, my mother's nighttime stories. And the teacher at the school found it very, very early to have such a, a control over hand and eye coordination. To kind of foster that, they took me out of school once every two weeks to let me go into museums together with my mother who has a degree in art history and just to experience art and learning about art and seeing these different artists and stuff like that. So I also grew up using tools and, and building things. So I told my father when I was eight years old that I'm going to be a designer when I grow up. And so I've never, ever deviated from that track. My name is uh, Johan Persson. Uh, I'm a Swedish native, um, living here in Hong Kong, having my own studio. Um, I'm an industrial designer by trade, but I would say that I moved on to be a little bit more wider and I take more creative director roles. I just like the way this city moves and makes things happen. You know, you're the master of your own destiny, really, and what you decide to do here can have an immediate impact on your life because everything is accessible. I have been influenced a lot by China, not just by its culture, but also everywhere you look, things are much more detailed. Hong Kong chose me as a base, I think. You know, I was working a lot in Taiwan, ended up spending a lot of time there, and I used to come to Hong Kong on the weekends and just have a little sniff around, you know. I needed a bit of international culture. And it wasn't anything more than putting in my mind together the fact that this was a city full of bankers. Every company, or a lot of companies, had large offices here, and I was sitting on Kowloon's side, just in a swimming pool actually, at the Peninsula Hotel, spoiling myself. And I just saw the Epsom lights, and I just thought, shit, something has to be able to happen here. You can't have this much energy and finance and factories and something not happen. Since then, I've just watched step by step the whole community grow and Shengwan become this sort of hive of creative people. Really, there's a nice scene going on here now. It's, it's just got a good vibe. I think here in Hong Kong, it's just crazy. <laughs> it's tall and short. It's, uh, it's uh, rich, it's poor, it's uh, manufacturing, it's service, it's, it's ocean, it's hills, it's uh, it's just everything in, in one place. And um, I think that's what inspires me the most, that you never see, you always find something new around the corner here, I think. Uh, if you dare to adventure in the, the darker sides here, it's, it's quite fun. So I, I moved to Hong Kong, mainly because of the hysteria around China in, in the West, and everybody's saying, they're gonna make everything, they're gonna own everything, everything is gonna be China, China, China. So I came here to, to see what it was like. And instead of being scared by that or intimidated by that or, or fearing that, I found it was this fantastic opportunity to sort of a designer's wonderland to do anything that you wanted. And that energy and that opportunity just flows through the city. You have this vision in your head, you know, what it could be. 
and you try to run that through the production process. The main risk was that I invested everything I had in the bank. And you have no clue whether that product is going to be successful. Well, there was lots of lessons. It felt like quite a natural step afterwards for us to set up our own studio together. And um, now when you look, you know, it's, it was the best thing we ever could have done. My name is Michael Young and I'm uh, an industrial designer based in Hong Kong most of the time. Yeah, I've lived in several different countries and I guess each, each city has its own appeal, its own dynamic. I think the, the reason why I've chosen Hong Kong as my home and why I started my company here is that Everything is very, very accessible here in Hong Kong. If you then see Hong Kong as an extension into China, you have even more possibilities there. The threshold of doing something here in Hong Kong is, is incredibly low. I'm in exile. I was born in uh, Vienna and uh, left uh, for New York just before the war broke out and had to adjust there. And uh, the process of adjusting here was not a difficult one for me. It's basically learning what your audience is like or uh, what some people might call the market. How do you communicate with them? It's something that I learned from Paul Rand show them something they know and something they don't know. I'm Henry Steiner, came to Hong Kong in 1961. I started my own company and uh, so far so good. If, uh, if you cast your mind back to 1961, I, I don't want to uh, sound insulting, but, but Hong Kong in terms of graphic design was primitive. I think my biggest strength was when I introduced myself as a graphic designer and they said, oh, what's that? It, uh, it sort of opened their eyes. What am I most proud of? Uh, I, I think eventually you have to say, uh, well, the, the biggest ones uh, for me, uh, the uh, opportunity to do the HSBC uh, identity, uh, including the hexagon, which uh, went on to take over the world. I'm also very proud of uh, the uh, sets of banknotes I've done for Standard Chartered Bank. I'm sometimes called the father of Hong Kong design, which is uh, accurate, but uh, kind of a mixed blessing because uh, uh, that means I have some responsibility for my offspring. and. Uh, I'm not sure that um, design in Hong Kong has uh, advanced as much as, as I would like. Uh... There is a point on this that is clients will accept often anything, everywhere. You see, and I'm not even talking about is it creative or not, badly designed, badly written, expected, unoriginal. A lot of the outdoor, for example, is a complete waste of money. Complete waste of money. So the danger is that you can make a lot of money doing really bad work. You can make a lot of money. And a lot of people out there are making money from doing bad work. That's not the fault of the creative people. Two guys on a Mac can call themselves an agency. But does it doesn't mean that what they're doing is any good. So you've got to understand 
what it is that you stand for. The creative industry um, it, it isn't very strong. There aren't challenges given to designers. They're, they're mainly, um, you know, just fixing things up a bit. I think this is something which is traditional in the industry that when people get to a certain level or a certain number of years experience or they're confident of what they believe in, they reach a point where they want to find out if they can really apply that in a more pure manner to put their philosophy and their principles into practice. And that's why people break away and start their own agencies. Of course, when I was working as a design consultant, every designer thinks about, you know, I could do this for myself. I could start my own company. Here's an opportunity. Here's a market that I've discovered by working with this company that I could, I could do for myself. And I tried many times to start businesses, to get royalty agreements, to, to begin new things. But the way that the old system, and I'm going to call it the 20th century, worked was based around this mass production making millions of copies of things. So as a designer with a good idea, you were shut out of that system. So nowadays is really the golden age for designers and creative people because the method of production and the access to production is there's more supply than there is demand. The thing that's in short supply is true creativity and great ideas for authentic brands that come from people who really care about them. If I had a business plan, uh, no, I'm afraid I didn't. For me, everything starts with a good product, and that's, that's the starting point from which I work. That's the bit that I know the best, and I know I can do that well. And if I do that well, everything else will kind of fall in place. The main part of my job at the moment is my watch band, Boyd Watches, where we design, produce, market and sell wristwatches. The main risk was that I invested everything I had in the bank in doing the first production for Boyd Watches. There was literally no money left in the account, so it, I, can, I had to. I had to sell the watches, basically. And I mean, necessity is a quite good driving force as well, if nothing else. So that was, that was a big leap, which, you know, paid off, luckily. We didn't plan to be a design studio. We didn't go out and say, all right, we're three designers, let's start Design Studio, go. We just wanted to make awesome stuff, and that was the plan from the beginning, and it's still, it still is the plan. The biggest risk that we thought we'd have, which was not having clients, seemed to be the one that we didn't have any risks in. And I'm just gonna count that for luck, because from the very beginning, we just had work and clients and projects that we've all really enjoyed doing. It's how to deal with creating stuff for other people and not just creating stuff for yourselves. But after doing a couple things, you just realize that you just do things the way you would do it and do it the best you can and then it will work out eventually. It's not just about designing a pretty logo or whatever, it's actually working with other people and talking with them and walking each other through how each other works. The startup scene is definitely disruptive. I mean, what you're seeing is not only the larger organizations losing talent to the startup world, you're seeing these companies actually take market share from the more established brand. What is an entrepreneur? This is such a good question. 
and a very hard one to explain. Everyone will have a difference of opinion. An entrepreneur generally will invest their own money, take their own risk and push it. And Reid Hoffman put it best, you know, building a company is like jumping off a cliff and building a plane on the way down. And that to me is the definition of an entrepreneur, someone that's willing to take risk, yes. Someone that probably is betting with their own time and money that they can make it work and ultimately wants to build a private jet after jumping off a cliff. Yeah, the startup culture really has encouraged people just to take more risks and be more individual. But I think I put a bit too much pressure on myself at you know 16, 17 to actually do like a safe career or a proper job, uh, which would be like a lawyer or a doctor or being an accountant. So I think I realised that that path was not really for me, and I just went back to the roots. And yeah, I've been designing for a fair few years now, and it, I've never been happier in terms of career. Hong Kong was built on the lifeblood of entrepreneurs. Like that's what holds, like it's intrinsic in the fabric, it's like in the air. A lot of us will never be able to like own houses and property. I mean, the way to make money now is to either start a company or be part of a company. Like a lot of entrepreneurs ask me like, oh, I, you know, I need to start fundraising or I need to do this. And I'm like, actually, you just need to start doing. Sort of the biggest asset I would say would be like perseverance. You gotta stay at it. Even when everyone's looking at you being like, they're crazy, you can't you can't think that. You have to keep that belief in yourself and no matter how hard it is. And sometimes you need to make mistakes to learn, you know, not every mistake should be avoided. I do think that failing can teach you a lot. It's not always a brilliant idea that you, you need, it's often an entrepreneur with the ability to execute. You believe in them over the idea, you know that they will make any idea work. To not just chase the money, follow the dream. That's probably the, the best way for designers to go rather than waiting for their clients to get smart uh, to start creating their own products. All the resources you have now, whether it's social media or things like Kickstarter, it's easier and easier and easier. My name is Josh Wright. I've been in Hong Kong about nine years, and for the past four years, I've been running uh, Catalyst with my business partner, where we make waterproof tech accessories, such as iPhone cases. Catalyst is about fun, freedom, and adventure. We just want to enable people to go out and, and share their life, take pictures, uh, be in communication, no matter what their environment is. I understand that design is a tool for business, and I wanted to get somebody from a business background's point of view on what I was creating. Because everything has to, has to be within a certain budget to make it feasible. We could build the best case in the world, it just might cost a thousand US dollars. Basically, what we're doing is, is not easy to do. We decided to use Kickstarter because, well, Kickstarter was kind of a new thing at that time. And we thought, wow, this would be a great product to put on there. And it was kind of a proving ground for us. It was a place where we could go and test that idea and also get funding to, to make the idea.
But we were not one of the large companies. We were a small company doing something totally unique. Kickstarter is not easy, though. Uh, that's then that's a whole other story. It takes a lot to do PR. There's two elements that are challenging with the product, and one is the waterproofing, which requires very tight tolerances. Uh, the other challenging element are the acoustics, which require very specific materials and very specific ways in which they're assembled. We're a company of problem solvers, so the problems have changed over time, and there's been different things we've had to overcome. When I do check out our social media and I do see what people are, are doing with the product, that's what really drives me. I think there are so many examples from, from really good, sharp, smart people that run their own shop here that I'm really impressed with. I've been here for almost eight years and um, I met Michael Young a long time ago when I came here and I think I admire him for his, his work here in, in Hong Kong and, and his you know entrepreneurship and obviously design talent. So I would say he feels to me like the most influential force in Hong Kong. I guess I exist rather boundlessly. Having never really had a, the a sort of a formal education as such, I was dyslexic, I couldn't work, you know, I was unemployable. I failed every exam at school. Um, and for me, design was about survival. It wasn't a career choice. It was just something that I thought I might just be able to pull together in a workshop. I work, I guess, hard because I remember the poverty I lived in 20, over 20 years ago or 25 years ago, you know, leaving home, never being able to meet, always having an overdraft, never being able to get any sense out of life because you know, there was no jobs to be had. It was just you make something and you try and sell it and then you scrape some money off the side and then try and build a new one. It was just, it was just anarchy, really. It was just not, I wouldn't want to see anyone go through that. You know, the only reason I think I survived it was because I didn't have any choice and I just came up with this happiness. Maybe it was because I was in search of an escape from the misery of poverty of Shoreditch at the time, where I was actually living in a squat, and it was so unpopular to live there. And now it's the most popular part of London to live in, but I used to have a, live in a basement in Redchurch Street with a little workshop full of rats. I had just had to make my own universe. I just had to make my own world to make this life um, worthwhile. It took me a long time to understand 
why or how things should be done. And even when I started working in plastic, it was a struggle. I think after about eight or nine years, when I started coming to Asia, I began to understand the importance of large companies and what they established in their factories as systems to, to make things for people. These things weren't about me anymore, they were about companies and survival and economies. And I suddenly realized the power of industry. I've never really known what makes good design. It's a question I've been asked a thousand times. But I think good design just comes from all the things you experience in life, you know. Happiness, sadness, relationships, food, every nitty gritty part of your life. I think um, the more you live, the better you can design and that's what helps things grow day by day. I think as far as inspiration goes, you get to a point where you're completely on the move all the time, visually and physically with what you're doing. You learn a lot about how to interact. It's not just about designing shapes, and it's, it's, it's learning the sort of, um, I guess the art of marrying uh, opportunities with materials, with how you feel. It's just a whole 360 holistic operation where you're reacting to the, to the present moment in time. This one actually one that's most complicated to stitch because they make them in two, two parts actually. Right. Um, so they have to stitch like all the way down here and then they like actually hand stitch like a part like the end of it because it doesn't fit in the machine when you go the whole way around. No, it's too much material, right? Yeah, it becomes a bit like that. But the material quality... Hong Kong is influencing Boris and um, maybe not so much about the aesthetics way but the hands-on, like, direct way. Uh, how we um, conducting our projects, that we're very, you know, we want to have fast results and we want, want them to happen now and we want to show results quickly. And I think that's, like, something you get out of the dynamic from Hong Kong. So I think that's the, the speed and dynamics is what, like, really, you know, puts a lot of, like, inspiration or, like, yeah, influence into how we, how we work. This one they're using for those, um, the, some of the 
Now get the nice labels that are doing. We choose product like our products by heart. For example, we, we're passionate about sustainability and it's important to have that in our projects. We're passionate about the honesty in projects and we, if we don't think a project or a client really suits us, we can, we can say no to it. We have uh, worked with very big like, spread of uh, clients, uh, both from Europe, the US, and also from Hong Kong, as well as China. So you see like, this in very increased demand for like, design and branding from like, Chinese manufacturers that are coming to us and they're like, hey, we want to start our own brand. Can you help us with this? We also need design and we want to launch like, a series of 30 products by Christmas. And you have to say, maybe we can't do 30 products by Christmas. But we can start with the branding. Hi, how are you? Very, very good. Yes, very good. I'm fine. Yes. Huh? Yeah. Can I test your sample? What you're looking at is really this, um, this region changing from being just this like, production manufacturing hub into more like a consumer market where you see the manufacturers wanting to seize this opportunity by taking all this knowledge they like gained and you know accumulated over the years from producing for the western market but putting them into like making their own brands yeah, four yeah. Almost. should we check this one as yeah. well and I think that's the, the most exciting thing that's going on now, that you really see a demand from China for like designers from Hong Kong or Western designers to help them set up brands that are actually targeting the Chinese market, but that are built to, you know, work for the Western market as well. Hong Kong is a very unique and visually. Our style is A little bit like Asian tropical, I would say. Ignacio Lasso when I say this, but uh, I think we have a we have an approach to to, to design and to things that we do that is very uh, enthusiastic and happy in a way. But at the same time, we're always looking to go a little bit beyond. Okay,本上係會同人講咧，我冇一個固定嘅style嘅，因為我哋覺得誒，我成日都講個thinking係。緊要啲嘅，你可以話我嘅方法係西方嘅方法，OK？誒，無論誒可能係個理由或者態度嘅方法，可能係西方係Western，但係嗰個誒內容啊，因為我哋住喺香港嘛，誒個內容都係好多時
ser aquí súper bonito. Sí, este cuello llega sí. acá. Pero es que no hay mucho, o sea, si los... Sí, mejor dicho, realmente que, no, es que todo el cuello, es, es que todo que el cuello sale, sale mal. No, un trench coat es así. Sale, es, es mi, pero es miti miti, los dos salen lo mismo. Uh-huh. Es la misma construcción, lo que pasa es que de overlap, o sea, pero un trench coat es esto. ¿Y tú le pondrías un lining entonces a esta parte o algo de tal? De pronto. ¿Cómo haces este detalle? Porque esto es feo. Sí, obvio, obvio, obvio. Ese detalle, ese detalle toca cambiarlo. Ay, y que el cuello termine así, sea una cosa como súper delgadita y súper... Uh-huh. Okay. Sí. Pero puede ser muy grandote. Chica, anything else you want to add? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's actually difficult to get her off there. Even that used to be my my place to watch TV. Hola, ven corazón. Ah, ay, quién es una perrita linda. Ah, siéntate. Eso, muy bien. A ver, danos una manito. Danos una manito, sí. Ay. Oh, she loves going to the mountain, right? Wow. Yeah, she's my hiking buddy. So we go to, she's actually very calm in the, when she's in, in, inside, but when she's in the mountain, she's a crazy animal, eh? She's like <laughs> running up and down. And... Into the world. Exactly, yeah. I think in design and also running a small business, especially a a business as small as ours, you have to think creatively on a lot of different points about business solutions, marketing solutions, how do you get a product from point A to point B. Coming at it from a fine arts background, I'm already outside the box. We both had wanted to start our own businesses before we, we met each other. It felt natural that Jesse and I were working so well together. Our ideas and design were very similar and also very complementary. It's something that is deeply part of both of us to direct how we want things to be. A lot of people we know romanticize the idea and say, ah, you guys are so lucky, it must be so amazing, such a tight team. Uh, we don't need to talk about it. It's not even an issue. It's it's great. It's hard to take holidays. The beginning was not easy. Uh, we had to find a way to have income without having any clients or products yet. So to get a jump start, like we started taking graphic design projects. We were lucky enough that our very first project was for a restaurant. They loved the branding and we tried to convince them to take it also to the dinnerware. They loved the designs we proposed for the dinnerware and they gave us the go ahead to actually produce the dinnerware for the restaurants and they also very kindly gave us the rights to the actual dinnerware to sell to buyers and that's how we actually started and to this day it's still our best selling collection. The area that we work in primarily is Jingda Jen, Jiangxi province. It was basically where porcelain was discovered. The fact is we're working with people in specific places because these places have a history. 70 to 80 percent of what Europeans see in museums are porcelains done in this city. Amazing bits of history.
Well, the first step is obviously a, a concept generation and having an idea of what you want to do. And you start getting the CAD drawings and you start presenting, you know, the, the CMF files um, and you have meetings with the factories and they say, this is possible, that could be a challenge, we don't have that production method here, I have to seek that elsewhere. And uh, you come to some kind of agreement, what you can do. And then CMF in general uh, is really tough uh, when it comes down to the details and the touch and feel and the finish and color matching, you know. Color matching different materials is not always that easy. If you have a silicone and you have a PVC and you have a PET uh, or PP, just color matching these different golden colors, you know. Um, what is it? Gold can be viewed in so diff many different ways. And which gold then matches? In a way, you know, you do your product, you're proud of them, and you do them with passion, and you do something that you yourself would like to buy. And I think textures and patterns and things like that, in a way, accentuate that connection. So that's what I've been trying to do in this case, and bringing out the patterns and looking at textures on, on these small metal parts and, and showing the different materials in a more honest way than just covering everything in plastic. I think in the West, we're overwhelmed with all of the cheap products and not the really refined, beautiful products. I mean, I always felt before going to China that it would be very cold, unfriendly, I assumed that it would be quite backwards in many ways. Going to the workshops that we go to, it was quite the opposite. It was actually a very warm response, very excited. Since I do ceramics, they do ceramics. We'd sit down and have discussions about ceramics. Design by itself cannot do anything because it's just uh, it's ideas, and ideas need to be facilitated in order to become reality. And therefore, you have to work with a partner that takes these to reality, and that's the factory or that's the partner that you work with. As in any partnership, it's a relationship with these, you know. It's a combination of the skills of a designer and the skills and wills of the company that together forms the end result. Ultimately, it, the, the, the manufacturing process inspires me more than anything because that actually builds the opportunity to try and employ what these things become in society or as objects. What we want to do is not mass fashion and it's not huge quantities and wastefulness. So we need to do like, we, our idea is to do very small collections that sort of grow uh, over time. And this is very difficult to, to, to explain to the manufacturer that even when you're willing to pay more for the final piece, if you order small quantities for them, it's difficult because I mean, in the factory, they, I mean, workers usually, they get faster as they do one, as they do something many, 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 many times. So if you're ordering a small batch, it's like by the time they're getting really efficient to do it, it's like, okay, this is, it's finished. So. Uh, and so I understand where they come from. You know, in the end of the day, a factory makes their margin based on the volume they produce, right? And the more volume that they can produce, the more successful they are. And the lesser volume you produce, the more cost goes into setting up the tooling, adjusting, and then you have a very small kind of production run of batches. And that's very labor intensive for the factory to do all these.
When we first got there, there was almost no Westerners. But now there's, there's more and more, and there's actually been a few very, very substantial European brands try to move in and fail miserably after a few years and left. Instead of going in and building friendships and building relationships, they went in and just thought that the money would solve that problem. Ego can really get in the way and not the easiest way to get anything done anywhere is, you know, make friends. I think Chinese are really, and I, I wouldn't say just Chinese, I think every factory owner it probably works and thinks in the same way. If you come to them and ask them to do things that are not possible or not feasible, they're going to say no. And they're going to say no because if you don't understand the process or are willing to learn the process, they're not going to try to help you either. I think in a normal human way, as trying to understand the problems and the limitations they have and show that you're willing to accept that and work around it. I think, as in any case, that's what you need to do with factories. Uh, I don't think you can demand everything. It's going through a process like everything else. You have to have flexibility. You have to build a foundation before you get anything really accomplished. You respect them, you understand, you know, their, their limitations, and you try to work within those limitations and try to make them see that there's a path outside here, which we haven't tried yet, but is probably feasible within, you know, what we have in front of us. And that's kind of up to you to find that out and figure that out. There is the very real factor of economics which allows a cheaper product to be made in China, but it doesn't mean the Chinese have less skill or less knowledge or are lesser of human beings. I myself love going to factories. I love understanding more about like different production techniques. I am like a small child in the factories and like how does this work and, and now how long does this take and what's the lead time of that and how much does this cost and, and can, we, can we do this but with that and, and like can we mix these two together? It's my kind of craft, you know. Uh, we talked earlier about Latitude 22, about their ceramics and the, the craftsmanship that goes into them. I think my craftsmanship is understanding the factory, understanding different production methods, understanding how I can tweak them and, and make the best out of them and something new. We're actually lucky if we have an invoice, like sometimes they're written on napkins or on any piece of paper. Our accountant hates it, but the fact is like we don't do contracts at all. Anyway, if they wanted to copy any of our pieces, they would still do it. There was nothing that would prevent them from doing it, and the contracts were not really of any big value in China. Like, so we just decided to scrap it, and we don't work on contracts anymore. We just work with people, and it's all about the relationship. Risk is everywhere, you know? you just have to accept that it's there. It's risky to stay in your own country and start producing something when you don't have sufficient resources maybe to back you up. It's risky and a little bit scarier to move to a place where those resources exist, but it's also where maybe magic will happen, you know? That rarely happens within your comfort zone. 
And you have to take the bull by its horn and, and ride it for a bit to see where it takes you. And I think you grow stronger, you know, as a human being to be able to, to do that as well. You have to. But the thing is, pick something that you're very passionate about because you're going to be working on it a lot and you're going to be looking at it a lot. You better, be, you better like what you're doing because you're going to spend a lot of time with it. I see us making a lot more products in different categories. I see us growing in our distribution and I see us growing in the, the breadth of product that we create. I would definitely advise um, people or the designers to go here, either to work or do internships, to start meet people, talk to people, go to design meetups. And that is a really interesting thing that goes on here in Hong Kong because when you meet other designers or you meet other like companies buying design, they are interested to share their knowledge and share, you know, clients they're working with or people they're working with. Great. Yeah, it's really it looks nice. really nice. Indeed. Yeah. The design community was quite small when we came. I mean, it existed, of course, but I think like since we arrived eight years ago, like it's just been growing and growing and growing. I guess we tend to stick with each other or find similar kind of places in industrial buildings. So product designers, fashion designers, graphic designers, photographers, printers, we all work together, which is fantastic. Get a great idea, get a passport, and uh, get going. And just see what's possible. That will inspire you, and that will take away some of the fears. And that will actually begin the process of creating your business, because you'll see, OK, this is the person who I'll talk, talk to, and this is the factory. And then it all starts to take shape very quickly and in very exciting ways. I think the best feeling is when you open it up for the first time, there's a real buzz. And like when you see it coming and you take it in your hand for the first time, but also I think even more when you see it on the street for the first time, that's amazingly satisfying because that's where you are, you know, uh, all that hard work in the factory and all the push that you've been trying to do to get this out to the market. And when you see that you have a response and people like it, that's, uh, that's amazing. It's really a nice feeling. It's been a very welcoming place for me. It gave me this uh, terrific opportunity to go into design on my own. It gave me a wonderful culture which uh, inspired me, an, an alien culture which I uh, profited from enormously. It gave me the problems, it gave me an audience, uh, it gave me a home. <laughs>